everybody. Welcome back. It's time for another edition of Silver and Black. Today, your podcast. Yes, it's yours. We give it to you all the time. From Odyssey Sports, we're an original from Odyssey Sports. Scott Colbranson, Mo Moten joining you. We're going to get into the Raiders today. Some question marks, some takeaways from mandatory minicamp as we go through this lull period. Really, everybody else in the world in the NFL seems is on vacation the next couple of weeks. But Mo and I are here for you, at least to talk some Raiders football with you. We want to keep you company. And uh, keeping me company, as always, is my co-host, and that is my partner here. That is Mo Moten. He's a senior NFL writer over at Bleacher Report. He is also a Raiders columnist at SportsNot.com, where I also work. You can catch his stuff there on the Raiders once a week. You can also catch my stuff up there all the time, and uh, we appreciate you doing that. Make sure you follow Mo on X.com, Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully. The show is SNB today. Okay, Mo, not a lot going on this week. You know, I think this is the, we talked a little bit about it towards the tail end of last week on Thursday's show. This is the type of, this is really the only time in the NFL where there's a not a lot going on, right? There's, there could be some transactions, but remember, most players are on vacations, even coaches. This is their like one opportunity to get at least a week away. They might not take the full two and a half, three weeks, but they do at least get some time away. We heard Antonio Pierce actually talk about that. We heard the players of the Raiders talk about that all last week about if they were sticking around town and all of them kind of said, well, now we're going to go for a little bit and get out of here because it's their last time until February. So they have to get that time in. Uh, so you look at this and yes, not a lot of news going on, but there is some things we're going to talk about today. And there is the possibility still that the Raiders make some roster moves and whatnot in the meantime. But um, what do you, I mean, for us, it's work, but what do you do during this time when there's a lull, just from your mindset perspective, without any football happening? Well, usually, as I did a couple of weeks ago, I pull an Aaron Rodgers and I disappear for about a week or two. <laughs> and then I get back at it, and then I kind of look over rosters. Being that I cover the entire league for Bleacher Report, I look over all the rosters for the Raiders specifically, since I do the show with you and I have sports not, and I had the bleach report lies for Raider fans out there. I rewatch a lot of the games from the previous year, especially for players who are holdovers. So I'll be watching a lot of Aiden O'Connell again, uh, leading up to the training camp. I'll also be watching a lot of Chicago bears football simply because of Luke Getzey and his influence on the offense as, as an offensive coordinator. So I tend to go in granular granular and just look into specific players and important positions. So we're going to have a battle at the quarterback position about the cornerback position, which are going to be the biggest position battles for the Raiders this summer. So I'll be taking a lot of look at some of the rookies that come in. As you know, I'm a big MJ Devonshire guy and I think yes. he's going to play early. So I'll be watching him out of pit. I'll be watching Cameron Richardson out of Mississippi State. Uh, Brendan Faison, I don't think he's going to be the starter, but I will, you know, he didn't play much last year because of an injury. I'm already familiar with him. And of course, Jacorian Bennett, I'll be looking at some of the things that he can do better in his second year in the NFL. Well, you forgot the, the best guy on there, though. It's Trey Taylor. Come on. That's that's my, that's my safety. pick. That's I know he's a safety, but that's my pick to click. I'll tell you, I think that uh, <laughs> he's going to do well. But I will say this: um, a couple things popped up, and again, it's this time of the year, and so sometimes people float things out there because, listen, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen, and until camp starts, uh, things are going on. But one of your colleagues over at Bleacher Report wrote that uh, he suggested that a trade with the Rams and the Raiders for Adams, for Devontae Adams, which of course you saw the, the picture for the show today is asking the question about trading Devontae Adams. And that is uh, uh, your colleague, Gary Davenport. And Gary suggested that a trade of a first round pick for Devontae Adams makes sense. And this is what he said. I'm going to read a little bit of this. He says, quote, the Rams admittedly don't need Adams. Puka Nakua, was a revelation as a rookie, breaking a 60-year-old record for receiving yards by a first-year player. Cooper Cup has struggled with injuries the past two seasons, but in 2021, he won the Triple Crown in, uh, in receiving. Adding Adams to the mix would give Matthew Stafford the most dangerous trio of wide receivers in the league. It wouldn't be cheap. There's no general manager in the NFL more willing to deal with first-rounders than Les Snead. 2024 was the first time Los Angeles had a first-round pick since taking Jared Goff first overall in 16 it wouldn't be easy to get uh, Adam's salary under the cap either, but teams play that shell game all the time. Want to seriously threaten a loaded San Francisco team? Uh, this is the kind of move it's going to take. So you think about that. Now, we've been talking about Devontae Adams. We had a couple callers the last few weeks 
you and I talked about, hey, no sense in trading him now. If you get to the deadline and the season hasn't gone like you thought it would, then that's where we recommend that you start to seriously consider it. But if the Rams are someone like that, I mean, Mo, at this point in time, even preseason, if 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 Les Snead got you know crazy again like he did a few years ago, trading all those picks away, if if, if they came to you and said, "Hey, uh, uh, Mostradamus, the GM of the Raiders, the, the fictional GM of the Raiders, um, we'll give you a number one pick for Devonte Adams," what would you do as the Raiders? Hang up the phone, but say <laughs> before I hang up the phone, I'd say hold that thought until the trade deadline. Simply so because not even for a first round pick before the season starts, you wouldn't do it because would that be throwing no. in the towel for the Raiders? It would be what how are, you mm -hmm. can't trade your best offensive player before the season starts. I don't want to compare it to the Khalil Mack trade a few years, a handful of years ago. But what type of message are you sending to your team where you trade Devontae Adams before the season even starts? I want to see Devontae Adams on the field with Garner Minshew or Aiden O'Connell in his second year before I make that move. It, it, just, it would just to me, it would deflate the team. It wouldn't make any sense to trade Devontae Adams before week one to me it makes zero sense no and what in about my your, opinion and what about your quarterbacks too mo talk about that because i mean gardner Minshew, we know who he is we know he's a veteran all that jazz but but aiden o'connell a promising rookie again i've said it on the record a million times i don't think he's a franchise quarterback but he's a very good young quarterback uh and if he wins the starting job which i think he has the advantage then suddenly you take away his best weapon and you don't want to do that to a young player either if you really believe in him Right, but you want again the the premise is you want to see this team, this offense together before you make any moves. Correct. Why make a move like that before you see the offense actually play an actual game? Who knows? The offense might be good, <laughs> so you don't want to <laughs> exactly. trade your best offensive player before you get to see the product on the field. Again, it makes zero sense. But if you're waiting until the trade deadline to see what happens, now if things aren't going well and Adams is frustrated. And he doesn't have a rework contract. As I said in the last shot, I think I think the Raiders should restructure Devonta Adams' contract because he has two non-guaranteed years left on his deal. Yeah. And if he is serious about being a Raider, and if Tom Telesco is serious about Adams being a Raider for the long haul, then you restructure that contract. But if there's no contract restructuring, the Raiders are, you know, heavens forbid, one in six or one in seven, whatever the case may be, by the trade deadline, then you absolutely consider the the move. It's very similar to the Raiders trading. Amari Cooper to the Dallas Cowboys a handful of years ago during the Gruden years. Now, Amari Cooper, not the caliber of player that Devontae Adams is, but what I'm saying is the premise is similar where you see a team that may need a rebuild and you say, hey, we trade this player now before he, he you know, his production goes down because he's on the other side of 30 and we're not heading anywhere anytime fast and we need a top draft pick. <laughs> so that's when you consider it. If the Raiders aren't doing well by the trade deadline and Adams is not happy. Otherwise, you're sticking it out. You're not trading your best offensive player before week one. Right. And I actually don't think, uh, and 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 Gary, your, your colleague over Bleacher Report that we're talking about this, and we'll link the story in, in the in the podcast and on the video if you're joining us on YouTube. The podcast that you need to is subscribe, by the, by the way. If you don't already do it, you can get it where you get your audio. I uh, forgot to say that off the top, as I usually do. But if you're the Rams, I don't think you want to make the trade either at this point now. Here's the, the exception, and I think you hit on it just a few moments ago, which is if the Rams are in the position, because the Rams are going younger, right? They've, they've, they have they've they didn't have all those draft picks. They won. They got their Super Bowl. Aaron Donald retired this year. They've gone committed to the youth movement there, which is why they were such a surprise last year. Nobody gave them a chance to do much, and they, they accomplished a lot. So now if you're the Rams this year and you find yourself, you know, again, they're rebuilding. So, so they get to the point where if they're competing for the, the, the title in the NFC West with the 49ers, then the trade makes sense at the deadline, just like it would make sense for the Raiders if, again, these are all big ifs, I know, if the Raiders' season doesn't go the way they think it can go and if that offense isn't going well and the record isn't good enough to think about competing for a playoff spot, then okay. And so I don't think it makes much sense for both teams preseason, but certainly towards that deadline, if one of the teams are in contention – i.e. the Rams, and if the Raiders are, they wouldn't trade Devontae Adams. But if the Rams are, then it makes a lot more sense then. Absolutely. And, I, and it, my colleague Gary, great at what he does, and I understand behind the curtain how these articles and how these topics come about. So I understand what Gary, sure. where Gary is coming from, so I understand the premise of the idea. He makes great points about the Rams' aggressiveness to acquire talent. They've done mm -hmm. that year after year. Remember Marcus Peters, remember Jalen Ramsey. I, I would even 
Scott, I would actually, if I'm the Rams, I would consider trying to do the trade now because Gary makes a good point about the San Francisco 49ers. The 49ers, I believe, have been to Love three it. consecutive NFC championship games, right? So they're the crown of the NFC right now, and they're expected to get back some, make another deep playoff run. If you're the Rams and you got Matthew Stafford for maybe two or three more optimal years, you want to optimize those years. You get him the best wide receiver trio in the league. So from a Rams perspective, I understand them doing the trade now because Cooper Cup hasn't been healthy the last couple of years. He's been banged up. He's missed a handful of games, 2022 and 2023. Puka Nakua looks great, but Tutu Atwell, you're comparing Tutu Atwell and Devontae Adams. It no is comparison. a no-brainer. I'm, I'm making that upgrade right now, and that yeah. Rams offense could be loaded enough to compete with the 49ers in the NFC. But see, the, the, and I don't disagree with anything you just said. I think, though, that if I'm the Rams, again, they've really committed to going younger. But at the same, they're in a very interesting quandary because I, I somewhat, it's somewhat, believe it or not, similar to the Raiders, right? The Raiders have built this defense. The defense is doing really well. They have all these offensive tools. They don't have the quote unquote franchise quarterback. The Rams have the franchise quarterback. They kind of tore it down a little bit. They're building back up around him. So their window is very small. So they're in that same limbo of do we, hey, if we have a good year, do we go for it and try to win now while our quarterback's still here? Because you know they're going to have to reset at quarterback in two or three years. So it's a very interesting, but these are the these are the reasons why GMs and coaches get paid such big money, Mo, right? Because you got to make those decisions. And, and the other point here is just to highlight Gary's article. Devontae Adams wants to be close to his family. It, mm -hmm. You know, if he goes to Los Angeles, he wouldn't be going that far. He wouldn't be that far away still. He'd still be on the West Coast, He'd be in California. So the Jets, Devontae Adams stuff that I've had to talk about for the past two years never made sense to me because if he wants to be closest to his family, why would he go all the way to New Jersey to play football and finish his career with Aaron Rodgers, who, by the way, is not with the team. There's a lot going on there. Mm -hmm. He would probably, if, if Devontae Adams were to go anywhere, he probably, one, want to stay on the West Coast. Two, go to a team that's contending for a title or at least a playoff contender. And the Rams check both boxes right now. They do. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how this all unfolds. But again, like you said, if you're the Raiders, doesn't make any sense at this point because you no. you, you you don't know where your offense is at. Yes, we heard the storylines. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of morph into that discussion right now. The storylines we've heard out of mandatory minicamp were offense didn't look good. Quarterbacks did not look good. Meaning, I mean, you heard from the players that they look good, but overall the media reports have said that the, it just nothing clicked for the offense. Not yes. New, new system installed Luke gets you there, but that's one of the concerns going into camp later on, but also the offensive line, which was a concern. All, both of these were things you knew, we were going to take a heavy look at going into training camp in July. Uh, but Colton Miller did not go out there. Not unexpected. Yes, you'd love to see him out there. But coming off that injury, you'd rather see him get healthy and get get 100% for real camp in July than go out there and do something stupid. So there's question marks there as well as the juggling of the offensive line. New additions, obviously great new additions, but still it's a question mark. Um, and so you look at all of that, Mo, and you start to think to yourself, you have just did a piece last week on Sports Not About the Raiders about what they may do with this roster. We've talked about it a couple of times. We got a call later on this same situation. Um, but but I, I get the feel, and it reminds me, even though it's a different regime, Mo, it reminds me a little bit of last year. Remember when we're like, oh, they're going to upgrade offensive line. They're going to upgrade offensive line. And then they didn't do anything. They didn't really – I mean, they signed a couple free agents, but it wasn't anything major. And now I think I'm getting the sense, too, that they're comfortable on the offensive line. Doesn't mean if somebody popped up that they didn't expect, they wouldn't go on them. But even at cornerback, I still expect them to do that. But at cornerback, it seems like they like the young guys they have and the young guys they have to compete there. What do you think of that? What do you think we're going to see before camp gets in or right when camp starts uh, of roster additions here to this Raiders team? Well, one, I'll say that Aaron Wilson of KPRC2 in Houston said that the Raiders checked in with Steven Nelson before he retired. So yep. they were interested in some veteran cornerback insurance before he decided to hang up his cleats. I wouldn't be, I still wouldn't be surprised if they brought in a cornerback. The guy I suggested was Adoree Jackson. And a lot of people pushed back on me and said, well, Adoree Jackson gets hurt a lot. Well, Adoree Jackson has played the same number of games as Nate Hobbs over the last two years. They've both played 24 games over the last two years, missing 10. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to get Nate Hobbs paid on a big money extension, but you're worried about Adoree Jackson's injury history, it doesn't make sense to me because, again, 
both have missed 10 games over the last two years. So I think Odori Jackson, to me, is a top-of-the-line cornerback addition if they want a veteran cornerback in before training camp. The other thing is, it seems as though they're comfortable, as you said, with the offensive line configuration they have. It seems as that also, uh, Andrews Pete will be the Khalif Barnes type offensive lineman where he can mm-hmm. play maybe three, four different positions or Jermaine Illuminar type player where he can play three, four di- different positions because he played left tackle last year with the Saints. Uh, he started off as a guard, a left guard. So we know he can play on the left side of the line, but it seems as though they're, they are comfortable with him possibly playing right guard or right tackle as well. Maybe as a, as a, as a swing tackle, if DJ Glaze isn't ready to take on that role, just remember you also have Cody White here who could play all three positions on the interior of the offensive line. So I don't expect another offensive line addition unless someone gets hurt. I pointed this out during my Bleach Report Live that Luke Getzey, while he was with the Chicago Bears, kept eight offensive linemen in his years with the Bears. Eight offensive linemen. So if you do the count right now, Colton Miller left tackle. Uh, let's assume Jackson Powers Jackson starts at left guard. Let's assume that Andre James starts at center. Let's assume that Dylan Parham is the right guard. Let's assume that uh, Thayer Mumford is the right tackle. That's five offensive linemen right there. Then you have Cody Whitehair, who I mentioned, Andrew Pete, who I mentioned, and DJ Glaze. So if they go with eight offensive linemen, as Luke Getzey has been known to do with the Chicago Bears, those are your eight offensive linemen, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I don't see them moving from that. I really don't. Like I said, if somebody amazing came available and they could go get them, maybe maybe it's a different story. I don't see that happening. But uh, but certainly certainly interesting there to 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 find out what they're going to do, what they're able to do. Now I, I think too the one thing, and I keep stressing this with, with interactions I'm having online, Mo, is is don't read too much into what happened at mandatory mini camp. Right, you're talking about shorts, shirts, helmets, mm-hmm. and yes, okay, the offense struggled. Okay, it struggled. Yes, you have a, a new quarterback and you have a second year quarterback with you know, with a new offense installed, right? So the terminology, everything's different. Um, when we start getting into camp in July, Mr. Moten, then I think you if you go a couple of weeks into the camp and you're hearing that the offense is still struggling, then you you can start to say, hmm, we got to watch that. But I, I just, it amazes me. And again, I know it's driven by a lot of folks like us who write and talk about this stuff for a living, but Really, you can't take too much away from it other than seeing how guys are integrating into the team, right? You get a little bit of that, too, from the reports like, oh, he's he's a leader, he's this, he's that. And I think that's that's really all you can take from mandatory minicamp at the end of the day. So there are two t- trains of thought here. There's, you know how this works, Scott. A lot of people like the confirmation bias. So if, oh, yeah. if you were down on the quarterback position already, you're saying, see, this is proof that the Raiders quarterbacks, whoever starts, is – Neither of them are going to be any good come the season, right? And as you said, it's early, so you really can't make that that declaration now. It's it's training camp. I mean, training camp hasn't started yet. It's OTAs. It's mandatory mini camp. They're trying new things out. They're experimenting. So while there may be concern there that neither quarterback looked particularly good, we can't say, well, this is what they're going to be like during the season because you have an entire summer. Uh, I think Antonio Pierce said they're going to, you know, toss some things out that didn't work and work on some of the things that did work. Um, so mm-hmm. they had some, you know, may, may have had some bright spots at practice, but overwhelmingly, Tashawn Reed, the Athletics, said it, it, the quarterback competition so far has been concerning simply because a lot of passes thrown in harm's way. Uh, but part of that is the defense is going to be really good, right? So <laughs> Patrick Graham is going to his third year as a defensive coordinator for the Raiders. Yes. The Raiders are returning most of their defensive starters. There's continuity on that side of the ball. So we expect – we've said this. We expected the defense to be light, year, light years ahead of the offense. Now, as you said, it'll be concerning if we get to August, midway through August. You know, it's one week before the season, and – neither Gardner Minshew nor Aiden kind of put together a good practice or a good preseason game, then you can start ringing the alarm bells and saying the Raiders may not score 24 points at the minimum as Antonio Pierce wanted them to. Right. And I think that's the key, right? Is we wait till we get to that. That's why you talked about, you know, confirmation bias. Uh, Hey, if you don't like the quarterbacks, if you like the quarterbacks at the end of the day, though, you have to look at that and say, be open-minded because this is this doesn't mean anything. They're Yeah, they're running plays, and you're right. The defense is far ahead of the offense. It should be. Like you said, three years, same coordinator, developed talent there. You had great talent uh, 
um, pop up when you sign Robert Spillane, who performed hi higher than I ever thought he would. And so you have that rhythm there. Those guys, those guys go into those rooms with the exception of the new guys and the rookies. They go into the room. They're familiar with it all already, right? They, they don't need to readjust and learn terminology. It's all the same. So, of course, they're going to be ahead. But like you said, I think you get to August. If, if we're hearing really negative things coming out of practice about the quarterbacks, then you should be concerned about it. But uh, the uh, look, I think the offense, no matter what happens, um, they're going to come along later. They just are. Now, you want that to happen before two months and 21 days, or excuse me, two months and 20 days from today, which is when the Raiders kick off the season against the Chargers. But it's going to be a work in progress, man, and, and we'll have to see. You have a new coach there. All that stuff, it really factors in. So uh, I think Raider fans, I think most of them are expecting that. I, I really do. From what I hear from people uh, is that they they do expect that, even though they, they love the weapons and all of, all of the other things that people are being positive about. I mean, if you have a logical brain, I think you know that <laughs> a defense that's been together for three years and returning most of his starters versus an offense with a new with a quarterback who's Especially. new to the team and both quarterbacks learning a new offense, you would expect that the offense is going to look out of sync versus a defense <clears throat> that that was ninth in scoring last year. Right. So, like again, you you'll see people taking their early victory laps and saying, "See, the quarterbacks are no good," at you know, and it's June. Yeah, and knowing that we have a whole summer to go, as I said, there's there's still a lot of there's still long ways to go before this. Now, like you, you and I both think that the offense is going to struggle with, you know, either quarterback because we see both Gardner Minshew and Eno Khan's backups. You know, we're we're not even saying take a victory lap now. We're just saying, let, let's see how it goes, yeah. even though we have our concerns about the quarterback position, but it's way too early to start putting out your takes and saying, see, this is what I was worried about. Yeah, because you don't know. Like, either one of these quarterbacks can fit into this system and have a great year. I mean, just go out, even play better and above what you think their ceiling is now. It can happen. I'm not I'm not saying it's going to happen, but but it's just it's the question marks going into camp. Hey, there's other little ones, too, like running back. How's that going to look? Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to see. So, uh, and then in the offense instituting the double tight end sets, with both Brock Bowers and Michael Mayer. How's that going to work? So these are all the things that we'll get to look forward to talk about once camp rolls around. It's going to be exciting, and uh, it can't come fast enough, uh, as I said, because it makes it much more fun to talk about when you have some more tangible things to look at and hear about than just guys running around in their shorts and helmets and having fun. So uh, anyway, that's where we're at. We're going to close out this first segment of Silver and Black today. When we come back, we're going to do our Raider Nation mailbag. You guys are a little quiet this week, so we don't have a ton of them. So we're, we're not going to approach an hour with this show, but we do have some good questions and we want to get to those too. And they always bring up discussion between Mo and I because we both can't stop talking sometimes. So we will do that when we come back from this break. You're listening to Silver and Black today with Mo Moat and Scott Branson. We're coming back right after these words. Welcome back to the home stretch here on Silver and Black today, the Tuesday edition here in June. Hope you're enjoying summer and it's warm where you are. Mo, are you guys getting this big humidity bubble we're getting here in Ohio with uh, with 90 degrees plus the 90% humidity yet? Have you gotten that yet? Absolutely got it here in New York City. And it's, I don't want to say it's worse, but being that we're on the coast, you know, you get that saturated air and I just, I try not to leave my house unless it's before <laughs> noon <laughs> or after 9 p.m. after dark, but we're definitely in that heat bubble. Yeah, I all those years I lived in Las Vegas, right? Um, both times that I lived in Las Vegas during the summer, I always used to joke with people who are like, Well, oh, now you're moving to the Midwest, it's winter, you can't leave your I said, Yeah, I couldn't leave my house in Vegas in the summer either, because when it's 110, as it's been already out there, um, you don't want to go outside either. Now that's a it's a dry heat, yes, but it's hot as hell. Here, the humidity, uh, man. I went, I walked the dog this morning and I was like, Woo, it just it hits you in the it literally slaps you in the face when you walk out the door. It's crazy. I can't imagine playing football in this, dude. I got to be honest with you. I know most people do, but holy crap. Whew. Well, the Raiders get to avoid the heat by going to Costa Mesa, so that'll be interesting. But anyway, we're back. We're talking Raiders football. We are an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. If you don't already subscribe to the show, wherever you get your audio, it doesn't matter where, you will find us. Just look for Silver and Black today. If you're watching us on YouTube, thank you very much. And awesome chat as always. Thanks for the thumbs up and the subscription, but don't forget, Hit the notifications bell. Okay, Mo, we're going to get to the, the mailbag here too. And I'm going to start off with a, a text. Someone who actually texted in last week as well. 
And that was uh, uh, Jay from New Freedom, Pennsylvania. And if you remember last, he had a question about um, AOC and the, and, the, and the backups and all that stuff with the quarterback, because the quarterback's been obviously a huge discussion for everybody. But uh, here's Jay asking his question this week, which gets to a question I had for you anyway, so it works out perfectly. It says, on a recent show, you mentioned the possibility of the R word being rebuilt. How long of a leash do you feel coaches like Getze has and this team before they would fall into a situation where they were going to rebuild. That's again is Jay in New Freedom, Pennsylvania. Uh, Jay, again, thanks for for texting in. And if you want to text in before we get to the answer here, if you want to text in or call in and leave your voicemail messages for Thursday show 702 900 7869. That's 702 900 7869. Okay, Mo, uh, rebuild. The word the Raider fans around the world have heard way too much over the last 30 years. But uh, what, what, I mean, he's obviously not trying to be overly negative, but he's asking, I think a pertinent question, which is if things don't work out for some reason this year, what do you do? I think the runway for most coaches is two years before you start to think about wholesale changes, because sometimes it takes some time for, for systems to click. So you want to give it a full year. You obviously you evaluate after that first year, but if players aren't buying into the system and are bailing on the system and it's clearly not a good fit, then you may, you may bail out after a year. Let's remember mm -hmm. that Luke Getzey wasn't the Raiders first choice offensive coordinator. The Raiders initially hired or tried to hire Cliff Kingsbury. Cliff Kingsbury had a change of heart, goes to Washington who drafted Jaden Daniels. So he's probably thinking he landed in a better situation as far as coaching up a young quarterback, obviously. But because the Raiders, because Luke Getzey wasn't the Raiders' first choice, and let's say the system isn't clicking very well, even though he has some experience with Devontae Adams, you can see probably if the Raiders evaluate after the first year, and the offense is worse if if not, you know, no real progress from last year's offense makeshift offense that after they fired josh mcdaniels and had bo hard to calling plays if, the, if this year's offense is comparable to last year's offensive scoring then you have to reevaluate everything but if there's yeah. incremental if there's incremental progress then you give it another year yes now you look at it last year and i don't know we'll see what the changes do to um to the roster this year but last year uh the raiders if you look at the age of their roster now it's only a gap between 20, 20, 25 and 27 between being at the top and being at the bottom. But the Raiders were the third oldest roster in the league uh, with an average age of 26 years and 11 months. Again, I don't have the data yet on this year because we don't have their roster yet uh, until it's finalized. But um, I would say the Raiders are a mix of experienced players with some age. Obviously, they have that there. And then some really good young talent. So they're kind of walking that line. So if, if things don't go well, I don't think, you know, it would have to be a complete – and we said this last year, remember, about Josh McDaniels. We said, look, if he loses the players, and what happened? He lost the players, and that's exactly what happened. I think in this case with Antonio Pierce there – now, coordinators are different, right? But I think with the head coach there and with Mark Davis tired of getting these guys in and switching coaches, he really believes everything we've read, everything we've seen, everything we've heard, he really believes in Antonio Pierce. So I think he might have – that grace period. And I'm not saying he can go out and lose 15 games. I'm not saying that, but I do think that they are committed to this course of action and the people they have in leadership. And you're going to have to play that out. I think it's three years. Again, like you said, the caveat, I know it sounds like we're playing both sides of the fence. The caveat is if things just fall apart and it looks horrific and players are having trouble, but I don't, I don't anticipate that happening with this regime. So I don't think a quote unquote rebuild is in the in the near future because i think they have the defense where they had they could still make the defense better even they've tied up most of their talent there they need to do a couple other things maybe after this year it's the offense and quarterback position they have to worry about so they're in a good position mo of putting everything together so that you can go out and either get that young quarterback that you need to take the next step if that's where that what, what happens if they need to do that or you go get a veteran there and then you also fill in spots which is where you want to be the only, I mean, it also depends on what you consider a rebuild. I, me, I consider rebuild is is firing your head coach, general manager, starting over at quarterback. But to me, in my opinion, I think the 
head coach GM combo is safe for another two, three years. I think, yeah. I, I don't think Mark Davis wants to turn it over again and again and again. I think he wants to get out of that cycle of change at those leadership positions. What will change within the next two to three years is, in my opinion, the quarterback position. I, I know people are going to scream at me in the chat. We don't know what Aiden O'Connell is. Give, give Aiden O'Connell a chance. Gardner Minshew could, could be the next Rich Gannon. Yeah, I get it. But I, I just don't see it for either of those two. I think the Raiders eventually have to find who their potential franchise quarterback is, and I don't think it's either Garner Minshew or Aiden O'Connell. And I always say it, too. I say, look, I don't mind if I'm wrong about the quarterbacks. If I'm wrong about it, great. You can come back and tell me you told me so, and I would gladly accept it and tell you, yes, you did. I just don't think that's going to happen, so we'll see. But, yeah, it, it's it's a great uh, a great text. Uh, Jay, again, from New Freedom, Pennsylvania, we appreciate you listening and for writing in. And also, Bo, yeah, I look at rebuilds, and I think about, for example, uh, what some of these teams are doing when they're trading off their best players, right? And they they dump – like, imagine if the Raiders, just, just for sake of argument, they suddenly trade Devontae Adams, they trade Max Crosby – uh, maybe not Max Crosby, but the, somebody like that, or they trade somebody else, a high-level asset, Michael Mayer, or somebody like that. They trade guys like that. That's when you know when you're in a rebuild because those are those are fundamental pillar guys of your organization. And if you're dumping them, then that means that you, you're starting from scratch. So I don't see that happening. And I, I see retooling here and there. You got to get better every year. But, uh, Jay, I don't think you have to worry about the R word, as he said. So – Good stuff. All right. Uh, if you want to text us or call us and leave your voicemail for Thursday's show, it's 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. All right. Now we have a caller. It's our good buddy, Anthony, in Idaho Falls, who called a couple of shows ago, I think, or maybe even the last show. But uh, Anthony's got a question for us. He's got some comments uh, about me as well, which I'll address, too, because I've already heard the call. Mo has not heard the call yet, but we'll get into that here. Here's Anthony from Idaho Falls. Hey, Scott and Mo. Uh, this is Anthony calling in again from Idaho Falls. Um, I've got a couple of comments. Um, well, first of all, Scott, it seems like I know I know you, you said that you were not a fan, you know, this is your job, but I don't know, man. You seem to be pretty excited yourself about this team, you know. I know you're a Charger fan, and I'm having to give you crap for that myself. I think it's pretty ballsy that you would <laughs> – admit that you're a Charger fan, or that you were a Charger fan on a Raiders broadcast, on a, on a Raiders broadcast. I think it's pretty bold of you. Um, you might as well just come over to the dark side, man. Just, just make the tra transition already, you know. You're already halfway there. You know, Mo would probably agree with you, with me. But anyway, <laughs> um, a couple of comments, you know, um, on the QB situation. Um, a lot of people that I've talked to assume that Gardner Minshew is a shoe-in as a starter. Uh, and I think you guys touched on it a little bit, but Aiden O'Connell has better arm talent overall. I know he's slow, not as mobile, but I think he might be able to change his mobility a little bit. And I think his arm talent is far superior. Um, so I don't think it would be a surprise if he ends up being the starter when um, the season starts. Just an observation. Um, also, um, I guess this is more of a question. Um, how confident are you guys in the cornerback group? And I, I know you guys think we should find another corner, and I do think so too. But it seems like they are pretty content on just letting the guys that are there already compete across from Jack Jones. Um, a lot of people think we need another starter. Maybe I think maybe they think that Jack Jones is ready to take that next step. Maybe they think that he could be a legitimate number one shutdown corner. Um, what do you guys think about that? Um, yeah, just curious and waiting for your answer. Thank you, guys. All right, there you go. Anthony from Idaho Falls. Anthony, thanks for calling. Get into the Charger stuff in a second. Mo, let's start with the important stuff first, which <laughs> is this cornerback room. And he mentioned Jack Jones. I think Jack Jones, I mean, Jack Jones is a number one corner on the one side. On the other side is what you're concerned with. And you do have some young players that can compete there. And then you have Nate Hobbs uh, in the slot. Uh, when you think about his question there and you you hear, you know, teams are going to say, yeah, we're happy with what we have. Partly, they might mean it. Secondarily, if they're in the market for a guy, they don't want to tip their hand that they're desperate. So, of course, they're not going to come out and say, yeah, we need to find another corner. They're going to let those guys compete at it. But what do you think? Would you how 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 much of a question mark would it be for you like a, a real big eye eyebrow raiser if they went into the season with what they have? 
It wouldn't be an eyebrow raiser simply because, again, I mentioned in the first segment, they, ch- according to Aaron Wilson of KPRC2 in Houston, he covered the Texans and Stephen Nelson played with the Texans. Aaron Wilson said that the Raiders checked in with Stephen Wilson, Stephen Nelson before he retired. So while on one hand, I do think they they have high hopes for their young cornerback group, I still wouldn't rule out them adding veteran cornerback insurance because it doesn't hurt to have quality depth at any position right you know so it's it's prudent to have that at every position but i think if they go if they if they don't like any other cornerback let's say stefan gilmore is not on the table right because i know mm-hmm. a lot of people want to mention stefan gilmore he's gonna have several suitors he's gonna have his pick of the letter and he's waiting for the best situation i believe you said this over the past weekend so let's say gilmore's off the table i like adore jackson's veteran insurance but what if they don't want it Dory jackson they say okay we're going to roll with the group that we have. My confidence level in this group is probably around, I would say, a four, simply because I need to see more out of Jacorian Bennett. I didn't hear right. a lot of positive reports out of Jacorian Bennett other than that the Raiders hope that he could take a year to leap. And to Sean's post-mandatory minicamp report, he said that Brendan Faison took most of the first team reps on the outside opposite Jack Jones. So Jacorian Bennett hasn't made that leap yet. He hasn't right. overtaken Faison as a starter yet. So... The Cameron Richardson's a rookie. MJ Devonshire, though I like him as a rookie. If you're rolling into the season with Brandon Face on, it's got the veteran savvy, but it, I'm, I wouldn't be too excited about that. <laughs> he no. hasn't. He ba- he basically he's a depth guy. He's a depth, he's a depth guy. guy, and he basically didn't play last year. I know he suited up for three games, but barely pl- didn't even play 50 defensive snaps. So he's coming off of a lost year on top of that. So there's going to be some rust to knock off, even though he's a veteran. I wouldn't love that. And yeah. that's why I, I still say you keep a Dory Jackson on call just in case uh, Jacorian Bennett doesn't take that leap. But it seems that the Rays are confident in that group. Again, I, I wouldn't be as confident until I hear Jacorian Bennett take the leap. One thing I do want to note, Scott, before you get into your, your Chargers fandom or <laughs> X fandom, <laughs> uh, Murph had a comment that he put up on social media, and it was about the quarterback position, I think. Uh, caller made made a comment about getting better with mobility. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's a matter of Aiden O'Connell getting better with his mobility or being more athletic. As Murph mentioned, we've mentioned on the show. I've mentioned at least on the show that with Aiden O'Connell, it's not going to come down to you know being faster or being more evasive in the pocket. It's going to come down to how well and how quickly can he read defenses. Yes, that's going to be his speed. He's gonna have to compens- He's gonna have to compensate for his lack of mobility and athleticism with being able to read defenses and coverage, precept the line of scrimmage, and making quick decisions. That's how he's gonna be able to evade coverage. Right, evade and, these pressure co- rushes. and these high, high round, or excuse me, early round quarterbacks that you see that don't make it, i.e., Zach Wilson. These guys, the reason they don't is not because they're not good athletes. It's exactly what you just said, Mo. It's reading the defense and catching up with the speed of the game. And I don't mean speed with his feet. I mean speed of reading the defenses and getting the ball where it needs to go. So, so he, if he get, and he already had a quick release anyway. But if his decision making, if his performance under pressure, again, he's not going to be a guy who's going to run out of the pocket and create out of the pocket very much. But if he can do that better, if he can be a better version of himself, because that's all you can do, be a better version of yourself, be better with decision making and reading the defenses. He can make up for some of those. So that's where the big hope is. Uh, and it's great that you pointed that out as well. Um, and I also think it shows the brilliance of the Raiders in, from a front office perspective in going after Minshew. Minshew, again, is not a big mobile quarterback either. He's a little different, a little quicker on his feet. He can create a little more out of the pocket than, than O'Connell, but he also lacks thing O'Connell has. So they, they kind of balance each other out a little bit, and I think that gave them the opportunity. Well, if the approach, if, if Aiden doesn't catch on and can't just get, develop as fast as we need him to, at least we got a guy who we know can, can lead the offense and get us close to where we need to be. So, so kudos to Tom Telesco on that one. Now, Anthony's point about being a Charger fan, two things. Mm-hmm. One is, yeah, I grew up in San Diego. I grew up a San Diego Charger fans. I hated the Raiders. I know, and so there's some people to this day who will not listen to this show because of that. And I always remind them that you remember where Al Davis came from, correct? You remember Al Davis was a Chargers coach. That's where he got his career started. Sid Gilman, all those guys. So he was he was very enamored with the Chargers because and his favorite receiver of all time was Lance Allworth, great Chargers Bambi, number 19. He's in the Hall of Fame. And so, but I was done with the Chargers in 2014 when it was apparent they were moving as a fan. Now I don't talk about it as a professional doing a show, but as a fan, I was done. I was done. I was like, I literally wrote them off. Now there's some guys in Oakland who did that too with the Raiders, right? Now the Raiders have moved so many times that 
you guys got used to it. I never got used to it. I also hated the Spanos family. I thought they were just crappy owners, and that's proven to be true even in Los Angeles, right? <laughs> so, so for me, um, uh, Anthony, it's it's not about fandom. So it's great. I mean, I like the fans telling me how they feel, and and Mo and I talk, and Mo grew up a Raiders fan, but we talk about things here on the show as sort of objective people because if I was a fan. I would be too emotionally involved. Now, there's great friends. You talked about our great friend uh, Murph and Michelle and 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 Swag Jeff down with Raider Nation Radio. Excuse me, Raider Fan Radio. They they're fans and they do their show with a fan and it's awesome. I love being on the show. I love listening to the show. I love watching the show. I could not do that. Like it's it, it's an emotional investment. And and for me, I love talking about the Raiders. I want the Raiders to do well. Um, mostly because I've gotten to know so many of you out there in the audience, and Mo and I have, we, we, we appreciate everybody. And so to me, that's why. So, so I'm not, you know, go to the dark side. I'm not going to like, I don't look at it that way. Cause people, Oh, you were, you're a Raider fan. And I say, no, I'm a fan of the Raiders doing well, but I try not to get too close to it. Cause I don't think I'd be doing you a justice as a fan by sitting here and just telling you what you want to hear or what other fans are saying. I try to look at it from a middle of the road, positive, negative, balanced out point of view. You get what I'm saying, Mo? I, I totally get it. And like, as you mentioned, I, you know, I grew up a Raider fan, but at the same time, I have a job to do too. I, yeah. like I, I said at the top of the show, I cover the entire league for Bleach Report. So I have to be objective in my analysis or else my analysis doesn't mean anything. So I also write about the Broncos. I put out a piece on Monday where I broke down the quarterback competitions across the league. And the Broncos also have a quarterback competition that I wrote. The Raiders and the Broncos, in my opinion, have the biggest quarterback competitions. Now, the Broncos have three potential starters, Bo Nix, Jared Stidham, and Zach Wilson, who struggled at Minitary Minicamp and OTAs, by the way. And I have to be honest about, you know, every team. Even though I grew up a Raider fan, I don't consider myself a Raider fan today because I am a writer first i am an nfl writer first and i have to be because that is what my career is and again I, when i get up on these airwaves not specifically here with you scott when i do my bleach report shows when i'm on you know tnt and i have to talk about other teams i can't i you know that fandom can't be there and i've and i've been able to suppress that i i I don't know if this came up, Scott, and I know you mentioned it. Someone wants to know how I broke into the business. I'm not going to get yes. into the whole story now. But once I started writing professionally around 2016, it, it, it came to a point where I was like, okay, I have to shift gears from being a fan of a team and being a fan of the of the league. I'm a fan of the, of the NFL. I want to see good football, whether it's the Raiders playing whether it's the Giants playing, whether it's, you know, the Minnesota Vikings playing. I want to see good football. I don't want to see bad football. I don't, no one wants to cover bad football. But I will say this. When the Raiders do play, you know, there's an inkling of you really want to see this team do well. But whether the Raiders are 0-17 or 17-0, it doesn't change my approach to my job. Right. I have a job to do whether the Raiders do well really well win the Super Bowl or go winless and they're rebuilding again. I use the forbidden R word. I have a job <laughs> to do regardless of it doesn't change my day. It, it, what I'm saying is it doesn't emotionally affect my day, whether the Raiders win or lose. Yeah. And I think it, it also goes to, because like I, you know, I mentioned Murph and those guys, cause they're such great fans. And really I, when the Raiders are doing well, when they're winning a game, I like it. Cause then when you guys talk to us on shows and everything, you're much happier. Yeah. Number great. one. But number two, I've gotten to know over the almost eight years now that I've done a Raider show, I've gotten to know so many of our listeners and fans out there in Raider Nation. I want them to do well for you. I really do. I want to see people feel good about it because I'm a long-suffering fan on the baseball side with the Padres, right? I went to the World Series when I was a kid, when they made it in 1984, then they went to 98 and they get beat by two of the greatest teams, the 84 Tigers, the 98 Yankees, right? So I've had a horrible baseball experience from the winning perspective. So I get what it feels like. So to me, I can relate to that. I just could never, like, I could never do a Padres podcast or a Padres show because I'm so close to it still. I still have a passion there for baseball. So I couldn't do that. With the Raiders, I, of course I want them to do well, but not removing the emotion from it, if I was emotional, and I see this with some fan shows, some great fan shows out there, is they get on and, it, man, it just ruins their whole night. Like, I don't get – my night doesn't get ruined. 
Now, that's the advantages of not being a fan of the sport. You know, my team abandoned me. So I said, hey, whatever. So now I love watching it. I'm in Cincinnati, right? So I have surrounded by buddies who are Bengals fans. So as long as they're not racing the, or, or excuse me, competing with the Raiders or competing with the Raiders for a playoff spot, I'm happy for my buddies when the Bengals win, but I don't root for the Bengals, right? So it's a very nuanced thing. And it's interesting because I think some listeners, some viewers, they want the person they're watching to, to be who they are. They, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But yeah. Mo and I have always taken the approach of, we want to give it to you down the middle. And I think that people appreciate that. And so our listener base, we might have some crossover with some of the other shows, but some of our listener base doesn't listen to some of those shows because it's not what they're looking for. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's all good content. It's all great that you get to decide what you get to listen to or watch. So um, I, I appreciate it, but I appreciate the call and the charger thing. It's so funny that the, the origin of that we'll have to talk about one time, but, uh, but Mo, go ahead. One quick comment though. I'll say is that the only, the only team that I can cover day in and day out or do multiple shows about is the Raiders because again, I follow the team since so, I was, yeah, nine years old. So I can't I can't see myself doing Bleach Report lies or writing about, you know, the the Pittsburgh Steelers two, three times a week and and doing a show. Now, there was a time when I did write about the Pittsburgh Steelers twice a week when I was first breaking into the business. There was a time where I did write about the Giants two or three times a week when I was breaking into the business. So I just want to let fans out there know. There are plenty of journalists, very good quality journalists, who cover teams that they didn't grow up rooting for, and they're very Most good at them. their job. Most of a them. A lot of them. A lot of them are not, are not covering the teams that they well, grew up rooting for. And a guy I love, JT, who used to have a show right after me when I was on Raider Nation Radio. JT the Brick, he's an awesome dude, Was been good to me forever and just a great guy. Um, he was, grew up a Giants fan. He grew up in, on the East Coast. So I know he works for the Raiders now and he, he's been there for a long time, but that doesn't disqualify you from it. So, you know, and that's okay. I think, I think that you, you, you follow the, the, the teams that you follow and we're here to talk about that team. And we certainly appreciate Anthony's call coming in as we do all that. Again, if you want to participate and you want to call in for the next show, I'll put the number up on the screen for you video uh, viewers uh, once more um, so you can see it. But it is 702-900-7869 if you want to get on the show for Thursday, 702-900-7869. Leave your name, where you're calling from, and your question or comment. All right, Mo, I know um, you're going to have a piece on Sports Not This Week. We don't know what yet because it's early in the week. Anything else coming up? Any more lives? Anything going on that you want to tell people about? No more lives coming up, but I can actually tip my hand and tell people what the Sports Not – Piece is about. Ah. And I'm going to be op going to be optimistic this week. I'm going to give you five signs of optimism for mm. the Raiders at training camp. So basically, five things that need to happen for fans to feel excited about going into the season. So I'll give you one. One would be the quarterback competition heating up. So that would be a sign of optimism if Gardner yes. Minshew and Aiden O'Connell can turn it up at training camp late july early august and start to compete at a high level and start to show some flashes that would be one of the biggest signs of optimism uh going into week one i'll have four more up on sports not this week wow see there you go it's usually thursday right that's when those drop usually it's usually, it's usually thursday when i have a little more time on my hand i, I can get it out on wednesday who knows you know <laughs> maybe wednesday it'll be out I, i'll do it a little early to get ahead of the curve because i know a lot of a lot of reporters and writers are getting their post mini camp reports out there so i want to get ahead get a jump on things yes and we're also working on you know as we go through this period of time when there's not a lot of news going on we're also working on some getting some interviews i'm trying to get in touch with some former raider greats some former raider players of course you know uh, we, we know you want to talk to woodson you want to hear from those guys all that but is there anybody you want to hear from that you haven't heard from in a while let us know drop it in the comments on youtube or or uh hit us up on x at SNB today or Mo at Mo Moton, M O E M O T O N. Or I am at LV Gully. Let us know if there's somebody you haven't heard from in a while. We'll reach out to them. We'll get them on the show. It's a good time of the year to do that, talk about Raiders history and get a sense for that, especially for your younger fans who weren't around for some of that stuff. It's always good to hear from some of those guys. Mo, my friend, I will see you again on Thursday. Thursday it is. All right. For our producer, Mike Robbie, a former Moten, I'm Scott Colbrans, and this has been Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. We'll see you guys on Thursday, or you'll hear us on Thursday, whichever you decide. But thanks for being with us, Raider Nation. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you then.